I appreciate the wonderful prayer the brother just prayed just a moment ago because he had many of the sentiments that I believe so strongly in and those things which we as God's children around this country had better be cognizant of in a time in which we live. And the song, as our song leader just chose just before I spoke, couldn't have been better. Because it's a proclamation and that every one of us must make. It is a profession that we should shout at the top of the hill that there is a God and he is alive. We live in a time where men and women have denied the fact that God exists, that he lives, that he has power, that he rules, that he is sovereign, and that he takes care of us. And in him we live, we move, and we have our being. Because of this, we have a nation that has lost itself in many avenues and many of the places around America, where we have, as some folks say, the most spiritually illiterate generation in the history of our nation. We also, they say that they're the most historically illiterate. They don't know who Jesus is, and they don't know who George Washington is either. In essence, there is a loss of those things that made America unique as God brought us into being. One of the founding fathers said something. Folks report that George Washington said it, but I don't know. It happened over 200 years ago. But they said that he said that God intended for this to be a nation. We used to believe that. We put it on our currency. In God, we trust. We taught our children to put their hand over their hearts and pledge allegiance to the banner or the flag that represents this nation. We taught ourselves to believe that God was with us in every way, and it was in our Constitution, those liberties to worship God as we see fit. This is a time when those of us as God's people, as God's children, need to realize something that Jesus said a long time ago. The Lord said, if I be lifted up from the earth, if I be lifted up, not man, not man's ways, not the Supreme Court, not the Congress, the Senate, the presidency, the governors, and so on and so forth. That's not discounting their responsibilities in the times in which we live. Even Jesus said it out of his own mouth. Render to Caesar what Caesar? When you, whatever it is that you should render to Caesar for what Caesar provides for you. The Lord said render it. Render to Caesar what Caesar, but render to God what's God's. And God gives us everything. I tell folk all the time, the person whose name is at the bottom of your paycheck is not the person that gave you that money. God gave it to you because in him we live, we move, and we have our being. And as the brother said in the wonderful prayer, that all of our blessings, not some of them, all of our blessings come from God. I thank God for letting me be here at this wonderful church in which your fine minister who has been so uh, gracious and hospitable this evening and taking care of me and making sure that I was comfortable. I thank God for you and the fact that you want the gospel <clears throat> preached in this area and that you stand for those things that are right. I pray that God will continue to bless you for many, many, many more years to come. Pray with me. Merciful God, we thank you for this day, for our brothers and sisters who have sang praises to your name. As we stand before your people, the greatest people on earth, it is our prayer that something will be said that will bring glory to your name, edification to each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. I love a lot of the old classics, and when I see them, especially those that come on at various times of the year, I'm just, I'm, I'm glued to the, uh, to the tube there to see certain of them. I truly enjoy the, <clears throat> the, James <coughs> the James Stewart movie that comes on at Christmas every year. But one of those that I enjoy is about a miser by the name of Ebenezer Scrooge. And if you've ever seen <clears throat> that movie, it's been made many, many, many times, and it's based on Charles Dickens' book uh, that was written somewhere around 1843, where he talks about a miser, a skinflint, someone who was mean and selfish, miserly, 
and he basically embodied all of those terrible traits of an individual who cares nothing about anybody else and cares only about himself. I love watching the transformation of Scrooge because Scrooge realizes something over a period of time as Dickens wrote that novel of him seeing himself in his past, his present, and his future, and eventually realizing that what a person receives in life are those things that they send out in life, are those things that they give in life, that you receive from others what you're willing to give. And until you're willing to give it, even the scriptures tell us if a man wants friends, he must show himself friendly. So when we talk about the lesson that has been assigned to me, a very good uh, uh, study that you have had in your, your lectures and very well good choices uh, in your sermons, I want you to think about what it means in Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verses 1 when it talks about casting your bread upon the waters. When we think about the title of Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastes is one of those books that's included in what's called wisdom literature. And in the wisdom literature, you've got those books written by David and those books written by Solomon. You've got the book of Proverbs, the book of Ecclesiastes, the Psalms, and they're called wisdom literature because in there, the majority of the way it is written is in a tactic called comparative language. What comparative language is, God will tell you the blessings and God will tell you the curses. God will tell you those things that are right and those things that are wrong and what he's going to do when you do those things that are right and those things that are wrong. One thing I learned a long time ago from listening to my daddy preach and also I use it everywhere I go is that God the promise maker is God the promise keeper. God don't make a promise he don't keep. And if God tells you, I'm going to get you, if you do a certain thing, then you can depend upon the fact that God's going to keep his promise. When God told Adam and Eve very clearly, very carefully, because God in his nature, God can't violate his nature. God must act according to his nature. In other words, God must always be just. He must always be loving. He must always show mercy. He cannot violate your free moral agency, and he will not punish the righteous with the wicked. So what does that mean? God must be clear and concise when he tells us to do something. Because if he promises, if there is something punitive on what you do, you can't come back to God and say, well, you know, God, I really didn't get it. I didn't understand. That was vague. God says, no, nope, I am not the author of confusion, but of peace. That word confusion comes from one of, the, one of those words that we learned in school, which means instability. That's all God's saying. He's saying if you're unstable and shaky, if you compromise and capitulate, if you don't know where you stand and what you're supposed to be doing, don't blame it on me because I told you what to do. God told Adam and Eve of every tree, of every one of them, you can eat of them all. All the trees, all the countless hundreds of thousands of trees and the succulent fruit on every one of them. God says you can eat, you can enjoy because God made our senses. God gave us our taste and our sight and our hearing and our touch. God gave us that, those senses and everything in paradise, everything, everything in paradise was good to the senses of man. The word Eden comes from the Hebrew word which means paradise. God says, I give you everything. But you have one prohibition. The tree, this tree, of knowledge of the good and evil, you can't eat of this tree. And God said to make sure that you can't say, I, I didn't know which tree you were talking about. God said, I'm going to put it right in the middle. It's right in the middle, and you know exactly which tree it was. When Eve was accosted by the beast who was controlled by the devil, 
Eve knew the law. She even quoted the law. God said, don't eat of the tree. And guess what else she did? She exaggerated the law. God said, don't even touch this old tree. God didn't say nothing about touching it. God said, don't eat of it. But that's the devil. The devil will always make us exaggerate God's prohibitions and minimize God's blessings. He'll always make us exaggerate the stuff God said don't do and minimize all the stuff that God freely gave, gave us. <clears throat> but that's the way the devil operates. So when we go to the book of Ecclesiastes, <coughs> excuse me, having sinus issues there. When we go to the book of Ecclesiastes, the title indicates preacher or teacher, one who addresses an assembly, one who teaches the people, one who stands before the people and reveals and teaches and edifies and unloosing those things that are wise. Because Ecclesiastes is wisdom literature and it is reported to have been written by the wisest man because God gave Solomon wisdom above all others. So when we go to Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and we look at verses 1 where my assignment is Solomon wrote something that is extremely interesting here and the fact is there are so many folks who don't understand the simple principle that I understand and derive. There's always profundity in the word of God. God's word is always profound. But, but God also wants all of us to understand. So usually the principle and the message is simple. So in Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verses 1, the writer wrote, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you shall find it after many days. That don't seem to make a whole lot of sense uh, to most people, because when we think of bread, we're thinking of a loaf bread or maybe even some corn bread or some hot water corn bread or uh, some biscuits or whatever. We don't think of bread floating around and then coming back to you one day. But what is Solomon really talking about when he says, cast your bread upon the waters and it will return after many days? What Solomon is telling us and and teaching us, when we look at this lesson, a Solomon is drawing the book <clears throat> to a close. He has given much wisdom there in that book of Ecclesiastes. He basically says this to all of us. When we look at our lives, there are trials, there are tribulations, there are hard times, there are temptations, there are moments of discouragement and frustration and disappointment. Job said at one time, when Job said, man, that is born of woman. Job's assessment was, it's a few days and it's full of trouble. And all of us who have lived, my grandma, big mama used to say all the time, my great grandmother, she used to say, Nick, just keep on living. Just keep on living. She'd get up out of a chair and go, Ugh, and we would laugh. We were children. We didn't have any better sense than the laugh, and she would say, just keep on living. She would bend over to pick up something and grunt, and we would laugh. We were children. We could turn ourselves into a pretzel at the time. She said, just keep on living, and guess what? I'm 68, and I grunt when I get up. I grunt when I sit down. I grunt when I walk. All I did was kept on living, and I understand. Well, that's what Solomon is talking about. Solomon is, saying, is telling us when you live, and throughout that book, he talks about many of the issues and many of the problems that we have in life. And the fact, you know what? They've got to be overcome. You don't have any choice. You have no choice. If you're going to go to heaven and see the Lord's face in peace, you don't have any choice. If you're going to sit down with him and you're going to walk with Paul and Peter and James and John and Mary and Martha and Elizabeth and John the Baptist, if you're going to walk around with those folks that we read about in Faith's Hall of Fame in Hebrew chapter 11, you don't have any choice. You can't say, well, Brother Deep Bear, life is hard. And 
Life is tough, and, and, and what are you trying to say? Life, Brother D. Barry, life will beat you down, okay? But when it beat you down, you got to get back up again. When you go throughout the book of Solomon, that's what, all, that's what he's saying throughout all that book. And you go back in the book of Proverbs, boy, that brother is, now that, now that's the man right here. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Now, when you go back to the book of Proverbs, you'll see that wisdom literature that comes out and it, and it talks to us. Here's what God has done. God has whooped a number on us and, and we didn't get it. Because when God sent his son to the world, he didn't come down on a charger, did he, brother? He didn't come down on a white horse with the fire behind him, with the angels blowing the trumpets and the clouds parting and the birds bowing and all the animals coming. No, Jesus was born in a stable on the outside of Bethlehem. He was in a stable where all the animals were, where the animal feces and flies and other vermin had to have been around there. It wasn't a hospital with people wearing white coats and masks on their face. Jesus was born in a stable, wrapped in a swaddling cloth, and laid in a manger. A manger is the trough where the animals eat. That's where Jesus lay. Jesus grew up as he, did. he wasn't destitute, but he was a carpenter's son. He was taught to work. He was taught to grow and be strong. He was taught to have a work ethic. He was taught in such a way that folks said that that was a good boy because the report was that he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor of God and man. What God do to you? Let me tell you what God did to you. Everything that you go through in life, God put his son through it. Every suffering, every frustration, disappointment, everything that you, we might, we complain, oh God, I have to deal with sickness, I have to deal with this, I have to deal with that, I have to deal with prejudice, I have to, I've sat for hours and listened to people talk about the stuff they've got to deal with. That's the same thing the Hebrew brethren, the Hellenistic Jews were doing around Jerusalem. Oh, this is hard. Nobody told us it was going to be this hard. They are ready to quit. Ready to quit. The Hebrew writer came in and didn't apologize for how difficult life was. The Lord had already said, I send you forth as sheep among wolves. And every one of us need to from time to time. When we start talking about our faith as Christians, understand the deal. Lord didn't say, I'm sending you out to a crystal stair. I'm sending you out to be gladly received by all the people. I'm sending you out to be respected by everybody you talk to. No, he says, I'm sending you as sheep among wolves. He said, they're going to hate you because they hated me first. Of course they hate you. You're Christians. You are diametrically opposed to the majority of the stuff that's out in the marketplace right now. Of course they can't stand you. You refuse to run with them in the same excess of riot. Of course they don't like you. Because you lift up the cross of Christ and you shine light. Men love darkness because their deeds are evil. And here you come light on a hill, the city on a hill. For the Lord said to every one of you, let your light shine. That men may see your good works, but when they see your good works, guess what? They see the rotten works of the bad men. Because you contrast between the holy and the profane. All of a sudden, folks say, you know what? I used to think that was right. I used to think that was good. I used to think that that was okay. I used to think that that was no problem. I used to think that the new morality and the new ways and the new teaching and the new beliefs were all right. And then here you come and show me stuff steadfast and unmovable. Of course the devil don't want you around. So this is why the Hebrew writer said, and this is why I said God did a number on you. The Bible completely and, and succinctly tells me as the Hebrew writer is talking to those brethren, he says, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all ways, all ways, all ways tempted, just as we are, yet without sin. Oh, my goodness, God has done it to us. 
We can go, well, God, you know, I had some unique situations. He said, no, you didn't. Well, God, nobody's ever gone through what I've been through. He said, yes, they have. Well, God, nobody's ever been treated the way I was treated. He said, oh, yes, they have. Oh, God, nobody ever talked about folks the way they talk about me. He said, yes, they did. I don't want to hear that. Because everything you griping about, I had my son put through it. And you know what Peter said in the assessment of the life of Christ in the book of 2 Peter? He says, who knew no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. So when you think about that, now we go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Now that we understand the number God done worked on us, that we can't go to God with some bunch of fraudulent complaints and a bunch of belly aching and murmuring and complaining. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. God said, I don't want to hear none of that stuff. I don't want to hear none of that. So what does Solomon say to solution? Solomon said, cast your bread upon the waters. He said, start doing right. Start sending out the right messages. Start doing the right things. Start treating people right. Start treating God right. Start worshiping God right. When you cast your bread upon the waters, you're spreading seed. When you look at that passage there, and I don't claim to be a Hebrew and, and Greek scholar, but, you know, I can study just enough to get myself in trouble. And when I look at this word, that word bread in that context, when we start talking about life, it's symbolic of corn seed or barley seeds or seeds that you make bread from. And at that particular time, uh, what Solomon is saying, when you cast seeds, you expect to harvest. When you sow seed, you're not just like, what you doing? I'm sowing seeds. Why are you doing it? I don't know. It just seemed like something nice to do. You sow seeds so you can get a harvest. Those of us who have farmed, I've drove a whole bunch of days on a John Deere. And, I, and, and, you know, I spent a whole lot of days chopping some cotton. And don't you know what? On those days when my daddy planted two acres of squash, who plants two acres of squash? I mean, who does stuff like that? Two acres of squash and an acre of okra, brother. I mean, who does? And he said, it builds character. Okay. <laughs> All right. It builds character. But you know what? At a certain time, we were filling up those square baskets. We had to crawl on our knees and cut them and put them in the basket. But when we took them to the market, the man wrote a check. In essence, we sowed the seed. We had the harvest. We did the work. We received the bounty. That's all. That's all. That's it. The word of God is so simple. God gives us the simple principles that teach us how to be good folks, how to be better people, how to go to heaven one day. He said, you cast your bread upon the waters. You sow some good seeds so you can have something good come back to you, and you expect the harvest. That word uh, bread in that context is often the same word as corn. In Isaiah chapter 28 and verses 28, it speaks of bread corn. In Isaiah chapter 30 and verses 23, it speaks of the bread of increase. In Psalms chapter 104 and verse 14, it speaks of vegetables out of the earth. Each one of them are talking about harvest. Once you have sown, then you get a harvest back. I mentioned Ebenezer Scrooge. Ebenezer Scrooge thought he was rich because he was hoarding everything, cheating everybody, being mean to everybody. He thought that he would find peace and happiness and riches. What he found out in the end was it is only when you give away, when you make others happy, that you can be happy yourself. Basically, what the Bible is saying, cast thy seed. Even though you can't account for where every seed goes, if the bread is on the water, it may float. You may not know where it's going. When you sow those seeds, you may not know. Remember when Jesus Christ used in his parabolic teaching, Jesus used the, the parable, what we call the parable of the sower. But, you know, the sower knew what he was doing. The seed was good. The only thing that was in question was the ground. So we could call it the parable of the grounds. 
Why? Because there was, there was stony ground. There was ground that, that was proliferated with thorns. There was ground uh, that uh, was good ground. There was the wayside ground that's like the side of where everybody walks and is packed down. And every one of them impacted the harvest. Where the seed was sown impacted the harvest. It was only the good ground where there was harvest. What is the Lord saying? You cast your bread. You cast your seed. You send out something that's good, and something good will come back to you. We're going to have problems in life, brothers and sisters. All of us, in case you didn't know that. I know you know it. You have a good preacher and good elders and deacons, so I know you've been told that. We're going to have problems in life. When we pray to God, we're not praying to God to change our problems. We're not praying to God to change our circumstances. We're not praying to God to change our trials, change our tribute to God to change the people. We're praying to God to change us. Change me, Lord. Change me. Give me strength. Give me courage. Give me long-suffering. Teach me to love. Teach me to forgive. Teach me to have character and hospitality. Change me, Lord. And when the Lord changes us, guess what? Everything changes, doesn't it? How many times have we been in the midst of troubles, and when we got stuff right in our head, all of a sudden, it was so much better. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 12 and verses 2, Paul said, don't be conformed. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Once I understand that this is not my home, this is not my home, I'm just passing through. We are a colony of heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. We're just a colony. We're on this earth for a certain time, pilgrims and sojourners, a colony of heaven. At a certain point in time, God has already set the time limit. God has already said it's appointed unto man once to die and after death. After death, all that you've done will be judged. If you've cast your bread upon the waters, it'll be judged. If you've sown the good seeds of love and kindness and forgiveness, it'll be judged. If you've sown the seeds of the word of God so that all men can see the reality and the difference in serving a living God, God says when you leave here, you start to reap because you cast your bread upon the waters. In Matthew chapter 5, 44 through 46, our Lord and Savior said in that beautiful sermon that changed the world, his longest discourse while he was on this earth, it's been said to be the best, the most beautiful. How, how could anybody top a sermon Jesus preached in the first place? We, know we shouldn't even have to say that. But anyway, the most beautiful sermon ever preached. You know what the Lord said, but I say unto you. He said, Love your enemies. What, Lord? Love your enemies. Are you sure about that? Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Lord, just that, that just don't sound right. He said, you need to cast your bread upon the waters, children. Cast your bread upon the waters. Say, you want something to come back to you that's different from everybody else? You want blessings? You want the peace that passes understanding while everybody else worried about stuff and you're not worried about anything? You want the access to my throne where you come boldly and tell me what you need while everybody else trying to figure out how they're going to do it? He says, you follow me. That's the way. You cast your bread upon the waters. How many times you've heard me and your preacher and others say, Christianity is not natural. It's not natural. Casting your bread upon the waters is not natural. Our thing is to hoard, lock it up, put it in the bank, draw interest on it. Uh, you know, don't let anybody touch it. Keep it. Even if I can't wear it no more, it's still mine. You know, that's, that's natural. Natural, you kill my dog, I'm shooting your cat. That's natural. But the Lord says, wait a minute, now that's not casting your bread upon the waters. He said, you want good stuff to come back? You got to send some good stuff out. He says, you love that enemy. Love him. Watch, watch him when you love him. 
You do right to those folks that persecute you and despitefully use you. You know, the Lord went on to say that you may be the children of your father, which is in heaven. Our father is in heaven. Our father's in heaven. Our father's not at the state capitol. Our father don't sit on the Supreme Court. Our father is not in the White House. Our father's in heaven. Our big brother told us in John chapter 14 and verses 1, while we are to cast our bread upon the waters, the Lord said, don't let your heart be troubled. Who? Those of you casting your bread upon the waters. Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God. You believe also in me. Why, Lord? Because in my father's house are many rooms, many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you who cast your bread upon the waters. And if I go, I will come again and receive you to myself. I'm going to have you because you cast it out. It's coming back. I'm going to take you home. Me and daddy are taking you home. Isn't that a wonderful thought? That if you do what you're supposed to do in this little time on this earth, Lord, have mercy. We're just here for a minute. We're just here for a minute. James said, what's your life? Have you ever stopped, James said, why are you keeping this and hoarding and not loving and not being hospitable and not worshiping and not uh, loving the Lord the way you should? James said, what's your life but a vapor? Just a vapor, he says, that appeareth for a moment and vanishes away, a flower that blossoms and then withers away. What does he say? Why in the world would you trade eternity for the little stuff we got down here? Which is why the Lord said, cast your bread upon the waters. Lay not treasure upon this earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and thieves break through. And still, he said later in that same sermon, he said, but lay up your treasure in heaven. You cast your bread upon the water. Where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, nor thieves break through and steal. You know what the Lord said? Because where your treasure is, there shall your heart be also. When the apostle Paul was talking to the brethren and trying to get them right and get their hearts right, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, when Paul was talking about the bounty to help others and take it up before I get there because there was a lot of suffering going on. The Roman Empire was, was a mean and barbarous and Christianity, they had been able to twist and spin the truth with fake news. We've heard that before, haven't we? With fake news and say that Christians were the folks that were doing all the devil men in Rome. Well, the Apostle Paul told the brethren to pick some stuff up and have it ready. You know what he said to them in verses 6 of 1 Corinthians 9? Paul said, he which soweth sparingly. He that don't throw, you throw some crumbs out there. He that's not throwing your best. My mama could, man, my mama could make some biscuits, boy. Those bad boys were that big. I was a tin biscuit man myself. And mama would bring those biscuits and put them on the table, and it would, man, it was, it was going to be a good day. All you need now was some chicken, some gravy, some rice, and some green beans, something green, and you got a good dinner. What, what I'm trying to tell you is this. What the Lord is saying to every one of us, that you have got to put it out if you're going to take it in, if you're going to receive the bounty, if you're going to have the good things you need, then you've got to represent me properly. He says, he which soweth sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. In other words, you're going to reap what you sow. When you cast your bread upon the waters, the Lord said one time, a lot of folks are going to come to me in that day, and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, you know who I am, don't you? They're going to have the resume, that dossier, and they're going to hand it to the Lord. Want to hand it to him if you don't mind me using this metaphor. Lord, I want you to look at what I did. Lord, I want you to see those wonderful sermons that I used to preach when I quoted 573 scriptures. Lord, I want you to see those songs I could sing when I sang better than the angels. 
Lord, I want you to see what I gave. And Lord, I want you to see how I act. Lord said, wait a minute. Stop right there. Get out of my face. I beg your pardon, Lord. Get out of my face. He says, I was hungry. You didn't feed me. I was naked. You didn't clothe me. I was thirsty. You didn't give me a drink. I was sick. I needed visiting. You didn't take care of me. He says, get out of my face. And this is what the Lord says. I saw all that stuff, but I never knew you. What do you mean, Lord? You weren't casting your bread up on the waters. You weren't doing that so you could receive from me. You were doing that so you could receive the accolades of man. So you've been paid. You got the accolades of man. Folks thought you were a big shot. You style, smile, and profile. You got all the folks patting you on the back. Now, I don't owe you nothing. I don't owe you anything. You reap what you sow, and you didn't sow what I told you. I never knew you. We never had a relationship. We were never close. We were never intimate. And what the Lord wants every one of us to do is to understand something about him. I want to make this, and I'll be done in just a moment. When you start casting your bread upon the water,